Hello everybody and welcome to Writers on Film, the Cannes special report. I'm delighted to be joined by Sidant. Uh, could you, uh, first of all, could you correct my pronunciation, <laughs> give your full name and tell me where you're, who you're writing for, Who's your, who are you covering Cannes for? Sure, first of all, you were close enough. My name is Siddhant Adlaka and I'm here covering the festival for a number of outlets including Variety, IGN, Mashable, Truthdig and Joy Sauce. Brilliant. And I, I, I'm not surprised that you gave me a list there. And that's why I didn't want to say who usually covers it for one outlet, because I've seen you all over the place this year. You've been, you've, you've, you know, I, I wouldn't, I'm not accusing you of spreading yourself thin, but you're absolutely uh, doing a brilliant job, I think. I appreciate that, though it would not be an unfair accusation. <laughs> okay, um, so first of all, I was interested in a piece that you wrote uh, and published, I think, yesterday, um, which was covering specifically the Indian films, which have been, of which there have been four, I think, four, maybe five, um, and uh, including one in competition. Um, so, yeah, let, let's, uh, let's talk about those first, perhaps with a competition for film uh, to begin with. Yeah, so All We Imagine is Light uh, by Payal Kapadia is the first Indian film in competition in 30 years somehow. Um, and it, it's a wonderful and luminous drama about these two um, nurses in Mumbai that sort of who have migrated to Mumbai from a different part of the country. And it's simultaneously a portrait of the city as a collective of outsiders. Um, and it's also a film about... Um, Kind of the way desire, you know, uh, personal desire, romantic desire, the way it uh, kind of overlaps with the political fabric of India today, even though this element of the film is a lot more subdued. Um, and maybe this is my read on it just because I've seen Kapadia's previous film, which played um, in Cannes at 2020, sorry, which played at Cannes in 2021 called A Night of Knowing Nothing, which is a docufiction film about student protests in India. Um, so this is actually her first uh, narrative drama that's ended up in the competition. And I think it's probably my favorite film at the festival. Um, you know, I was expecting good things because, um, like I said, I love um, her feature debut, the docufiction one. Uh, but there was something about this that was both entirely expected from a filmmaker like her stylistically but also unexpected in the way she's able to weave together all these various different approaches to drama in ways that you don't often see this um, sort of a languid approach that still feels very energetic um, and a documentarian lens applied to drama in a way that always centers not only the characters but their environments and so to me as someone from Mumbai it feels very true to not just what Mumbai looks like but what it feels like especially um, during the monsoon season this is one of the most blue films that I've ever seen and I mean that on multiple fronts it um, I, I'm pretty sure the color blue appears in almost every frame of the movie and in the process it becomes kind of a reminder of Mumbai and where the characters are from because without getting into details they uh, take a detour away from the city at one point and these hints of blue kind of remain as reminders of who they are and the lives that they're tethered to and by the end, sorry. sorry I love the, the what you said earlier about the documentarian aspect because even at the beginning there are these uh, sort of almost like vox pox moments where people are talking about their experiences of living in Mumbai and they're all immigrant experiences and it's almost like an old-fashioned you know New York has a million stories this is one of them you know it has yeah. that sort of we're picking out these pieces and also the political aspect that you're talking about this is about love crossing lines of religion of family of class and uh, yeah, although not apparently sort of in your face as a political film, I've got to imagine in the context of the elections that have taken place uh, and are ongoing at the moment, I believe, uh, this that idea, you know, love crosses lines, is kind of radical. Yeah, if uh, one of the uh, main plots of the film concerns a, a young Hindu woman uh, who's in love with a Muslim man. 
and whether or not you're trying to be political about something like that that becomes an inherently political image to place on screen um in India today especially with you know like you said the ongoing elections uh because um the the hindutva right wing in India has had um let's just say very islamophobic leanings especially over the last decade um and if you get into some of the specifics of you know the propaganda and all that a big element of that is um this fearmongering idea of love jihad which is this um this untrue concept of muslim men conspiring to sort of forcefully convert hindu women whereas the film has just a much more realistic depiction of what a hindu muslim romance would be like including the various um hurdles to it and not just the larger hurdles of you know what's my family going to think what's your family going to think but also hurdles like just finding a place to make out because in a city like mumbai uh, if you're below a certain class threshold um that can be an especially complicated thing because you know a lot of indian youths live with their parents and there are a lot of hotels that won't um rent out to unmarried couples uh, and so none of this is spoken directly in the film but the political implications are sort of always hovering in the background but there's even a scene where a young couple goes to like a parking uh, garage because and they've they've bribed uh, the guards to get a few a few moments pr- privacy that's right and i think it's um one of the first times in the film we really see these characters be intimate and you get a sense of just what they've had to go through uh, just to kiss each other <laughs> It's crazy. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. I agree with you. I thought this was a thoroughly fascinating film, beautiful film to look at, and the performances were also uh, significant, especially from the two sort of nurses who share their flat together and are both in uh, affairs with uh, men who, who, for various reasons, they're keeping secret both from each other and from various other people. I've talked to a lot of people who have rated this very highly, and you know, hopefully, it will be in with a shout when it comes to the awards. What, what do you think about that? I mean, we're probably putting these out afterwards, but uh, do you think it's got a good chance? I do. I, I think it's one of the strongest films in the competition, and um, regardless of whether it wins, you know, one of the biggest awards, although I'm sure we'll know by the time this comes out, um, it it's a big moment for. Indian cinema uh and a big anti-establishment moment um for Indian filmmaking. Is that true of it just being in competition as well? Yeah, that too because um Kapadia's first film, A Night of Knowing Nothing, uh was not released in India in any capacity. Um I couldn't tell you the degree to which any conversations about distribution did or didn't happen, but uh just watching it it becomes at least to me very apparent that Okay, this is not the kind of film that would release under the Modi government of which it's very critical. And uh while something like All We Imagine as Light is you know not as directly in your face about party politics, it still has that same anti-establishment streak to it. Again, centering the Hindu-Muslim romance and um just this frank depiction of um Indian women of femininity, of sex, of this sort of gentle non-sexualized nudity uh but also let's simply sex scenes which uh would more than likely be cut out in any indian release um so it's a film that flies in the face of everything indian establishment cinema is all about whether it's um these sort of you know large propagandist films about you know nationalist topics or it's even just the depiction of women in mainstream indian cinema which uh even though there have there has been forward movement on that front it still tends to be very limited and very preachy in a way that's you know look at the camera and explain the theme whereas uh a film like this sort of has the freedom to um depict lived experiences without um having to you know stop the story and stop its rhythms to stand on a soapbox And well that kind of storytelling can be important as well for um what's called a mass audience in India. Um you know it's it's not the only way to tell a story and there isn't as much room in Indian filmmaking for a film like as we imagine as, as all we imagine is light the title that I keep forgetting. 
my roommates and I have just been referring to it as Bayal Gabadia's film all week. Um, and, and that's why a lot of the films you'll see making big waves at um, international festivals are Indian co-productions. Uh, or in some cases, films set in India and made by Indian filmmakers uh, that don't have any Indian money behind it at all. Uh, especially, you know, documentaries that tackle difficult or controversial controversial subjects. Um, because increasingly there's less room uh, to experiment and less room to tell bold stories that kind of rattle the cage, politically speaking. Um, but at Cannes specifically this year, it's been, I would say, a fairly good year specifically for Indian women on screen. Um, because in addition to All We Imagine Is Light, you have this movie The Shameless, which is... Uh, it's not an Indian production, but it's set in India and features um, two Indian women in the leads, a queer couple, um, one of whom, uh, I believe the actress, won the Asatan Regard Award for Best Performance. Um, then you have Santosh, which is, again, I believe a co-production about um, an Indian policewoman who, uh, through a government scheme, uh, ends up inheriting her husband's police job when he dies and it starts out in the vein of um, one of the sort of aforementioned preachy kind of films that you see where it's like well the police are trying to protect people and they're trying to do good and this one policewoman is going to fix all these problems but then it it becomes much darker and more nuanced when it starts to confront the fact that at the end of the day even though putting a woman in a police uniform can be empowering in certain ways, at the end of the day, it is a power fantasy that intersects with all of these ideas of caste and religion. Um, and then it sort of becomes almost in conversation with a lot of mainstream Indian movies, which are direct um, police power fantasies. There are a lot of you know, really big, expensive, like recent Bollywood movies uh, that are about how cool the police are and you know, that end with... Um, Copaganda. End, exactly, end with cops uh, all but saying to the camera that um, suspected rapists should be extrajudicially executed. And so it kind of confronts those power fantasies as well. And then you have Sister Midnight, um, which is more of a, a tongue-in-cheek comedy. Um, again, it's about a, a woman who has an arranged marriage and is stuck in this really small apartment in Mumbai. And it doesn't necessarily demonize her husband, although he's a bit of a, a loser in a lot of ways. Um, but it, it is both realistic in its depiction of the way a lot of marriages can function um, in India, but also it kind of goes off the rails with like silly, surreal imagery. And again, it centers some really fun performances and it's tonally very different from the other films I just mentioned it I, I would liken it to um, specifically the funeral scene in the Grand Budapest Hotel by Wes Anderson just that rapid fire energy for two straight hours that, that sounds amazing and it sounds great that there are so many I haven't seen uh, those three films I'm afraid um, although I am getting a link for uh, Sister Midnight so I'm going to catch up with that later on today hopefully um, but it, it's it's heartening that there are films uh, uh, from India being represented in the film festival which aren't all the same which aren't all the same genre um, like just say not there's anything wrong with it but just say social realism dealing with certain issues you know after all uh, you know you've got a population of top topping over a billion people there's got to be more than one story to tell yeah certainly and I think um, it does raise an interesting question of what the responsibility is of any given Indian film is is a is an Indian drama inherently a social drama because there are all these aspects of Indian life that are inseparable from politics as is the case in many places of course but um, you know if you're not confronting the ideas of class and religion or at least contextualizing them in some way um, then are you doing a disservice to your own story it's always a question that kind of runs in the back of my head I, I don't think there's an easy answer but like you said it's been really interesting to see 
for films that even though they are about you know quote unquote women in indian society they tackle these ideas so differently uh with different styles you know uh visually and narratively um and interestingly there's also a fifth indian film about indian women that premiered at sundance but also played at cannes this year called girls will be girls which is a coming of age story about a teenage girl uh in a boarding school but is also a coming of age story about her mother uh and her mother kind of living vicariously through her daughter uh and trying to grasp at the coming of age that she was never allowed to have and uh the mother character in that is played by Kani Kusruti who's the lead in All We Imagine Is Light so mm. it's been a very good year for her excellent excellent yeah. and um uh you've already said that All We Imagine Is Light uh is your you think your strongest film you've seen in competition but what what are the other films that you've you particularly enjoyed it's been a really backloaded festival um i think a couple of the other really strong ones i think it's you know hard to say anything bad about the seed of the sacred fig which to begin with is just a title that uh you can just see winning a palm just if you know nothing else about it you see the title seed of the sacred fig that's poetic enough to give an award to the house of pomegranates exactly um but i that's another one that is radical and risky in its filmmaking of course the director you know made it illegally and was almost thrown in prison and you know escaped iran before being thrown in prison um so there's the, and it's that sort of story behind it also translates to what it does on screen cuz it's almost 3 hours long but it it's sort of this rolling train of ideas and subplots that dovetail into each other that all you know separately if you you know pick it apart and analyze it these are all ideas that feel disparate even though they all concern uh contemporary Iranian politics but the way they morph from one thing to the next through the lens of this one family of four i think is just some of the mas- most masterful writing and directing that i've seen at the festival yeah i loved it i thought that was a, a real classic and if it won the palm d'or i would have absolutely no problem with that whatsoever anything else you want to mention uh if it does win the palm that makes the distributor neon 5 for 5 in the last five games and neon also have an aura which uh yeah. would be my i've i've just done my list and i put them joint first no anora is also another wonderful one that premiered late in the festival um so good for neon um but yeah if i had to pick my two favorites they would be all we imagine is light and seed of the sacred fake which also have um a theme in common and a word in common that i think sums up this moment in international cinema which is azadi um uh it means freedom in both uh persian and a lot of indian languages like hindi you see it scrolled on a wall in one moment in all we imagine is light you hear it chanted as part of the women life freedom movement in the iranian film and it's two very different depictions of what freedom means to people on one hand you have political freedom on the other hand you have this more personal intimate form of uh social liberation um but i i do think it makes these two films an interesting bearing uh, to come out as the strongest of the festival excellent that's so that's so interesting asadi asadi yeah. asadi okay i'm going to i'm going to remember that yeah, and you, you would have heard it chanted against your people as several decades ago my yeah. people the <laughs> yeah. I, the irish oh wait a second are you irish <laughs> i'm half irish well, um, i play that card whenever oh whenever i'm accused Screw of you <laughs> excellent thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much sidhat <laughs> you're very welcome thank you for having me what a brilliant way of ending <laughs> 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 <laughs>